hombre, tolero voy a decir esto, es no toleramos más la imbecilidad política, la imbecilidad criminal. Estamos hasta la madre. Ni un muerto más. Si hemos venido hasta aquí y hemos recorrido desde nuestro país y en este país miles de kilómetros, miles de millas, es para decirles eso. Si no quieren morir, no importa. Si no quieren ver, no importa. Si quieren seguir envileciendo, seguir envileciendo a la humanidad, no importa. Nosotros decimos que no. Nosotros estamos de aquí y con la conciencia en paz. Y el día que sucedan más tragedias, podemos decirle a la cara, se los dijimos imbéciles. Han decidido estar arrodillados ante la mierda, ante el capital, ante la destrucción, y nosotros no hemos tomado ese camino. Venimos a decirles que el camino es la paz, que el camino es el ciudadano, que el camino es la vida humana, que el camino es la proporción. Nos llegaremos a Washington para reiterar y nos iremos como hace 39 años Martin Luther King, después de pronunciar su discurso, nos iremos con la conciencia tranquila y con el sueño, el sueño de que hemos hecho la paz. Nosotros, como jóvenes estudiantes, 
hemos sido otro grupo de tantos que cargamos con nombres de víctimas de estas identidades, tanto de México como de Estados Unidos. Personas que tenían entre 11 y 28 años. Algunas de estas son Darío Álvarez, Juan Francisco Cecilia, Alexis Penumea, Carlos Cuevas, Ivonne Ramírez, Adriana Mornet, Justin Deschamps, José Joaquín García Jurado Carmona, José Guerena, Reverendo Jonathan Ayers, Rachel Hoffman, Trevon Cole, Tarika Wilson, Patricia Stockro, Alberto Sepúlveda, Ashley Villarreal, así como los jóvenes de Villa de Salvarca, de Salvarca, y a los que sumamos los siete jóvenes violentamente asesinados el día de ayer en San Luis Potosí, entre tantos y tantas más. Toda esta situación que ha resultado de la guerra contra las drogas son consecuencias no planteadas originalmente y que el gobierno no ha tenido la disposición para enfrentarlas ni ha asumido su responsabilidad sobre estos resultados. En este camino que iniciamos con la caravana desde el 11 de agosto en la ciudad de Tijuana, hemos trabajado en conjunto con las demás organizaciones, promoviendo la necesidad de empezar un diálogo sobre las alternativas a la fallida guerra contra las drogas. Quisiéramos entrar en ese diálogo hablando sobre lo que sí queremos como política de drogas, que esperamos, qué responsabilidades, de qué responsabilidades queremos que debe tomar el Estado, a quienes queremos que proteja y cómo queremos que lo haga. La política sobre drogas tiene que ser una política de salud pública, como acaba de mencionar Javier Sicilio, no como está planteada y ejecutada actualmente como una política de seguridad nacional. Esto permitiría que la seguridad nacional se centrara en la seguridad humana y en la protección de las y los ciudadanos, y no en la criminalización de adictos o usuarios de drogas, y menos en la misma criminalización de la juventud, la pobreza, las comunidades indígenas y tantos tantos más. Entonces, ¿qué queremos en esta nueva política hacia las drogas? Luchamos por construir una política en cuyo centro estén las personas. Para esto se requiere que esta política tenga una perspectiva de reducción de daños, así como de seguridad humana, que considere la protección de los usuarios de sustancias, tanto las que actualmente son legales como las ilegales, además del entorno que son las familias y las comunidades de estos usuarios. También el acceso medicinal a sustancias que no están al alcance de los pacientes que las requieren y una regulación del mercado de drogas, lo que no significa una apertura en el mercado para estas sustancias, sino la construcción de modelos que permitan controlar el modo en que las distintas personas y poblaciones tienen acceso a las sustancias. Es importante retomar las experiencias de otros países. En algunos casos, como Portugal o Suiza, donde se han implementado políticas no cognitivas, se ha detenido el aumento en el uso de drogas y han disminuido los daños relacionados al uso de las mismas, por ejemplo, la transmisión del virus de VIH, además de la violencia generada por el mercado negro. En cambio, en países como Rusia, que se han agravado las sanciones por el uso de drogas, ha habido un aumento en los daños generados por el uso de las mismas. Para poner un ejemplo, para nuestras organizaciones, el cambio en la situación legal y social de la cannabis o marihuana es un primer paso necesario. Su regulación permitiría varios puntos. Quitar la principal fuente de ingreso a los grupos del crimen organizado de México, que según la DEA es de 140 mil millones de dólares al año solo del mercado ilegal de marihuana. Reducir la sobrepoblación carcelaria y la criminalización de jóvenes. Hay una población estimada de 800.000 presos al año solo por posesión de marihuana en Estados Unidos. Actualmente, se punto, un millón de personas tienen acceso a la marihuana medicinal en Estados Unidos de manera legal, lo que significa que estas personas no tienen que ponerse en situaciones de riesgo para acceder a su medicina sin financiar al crimen organizado. Y como último y cuarto punto, esto permitiría aplicar, ampliar la investigación sobre esta planta, sus múltiples usos, sus, sus impactos en el organismo, entre tantos otros puntos que están en el mercado. Mientras más información tengamos, mejor podremos relacionarnos con esta planta. Nosotros afirmamos 
que esta política sería un paso en la construcción de un Estado democrático. Esta ley significaría un cambio en la construcción de este Estado democrático, porque es una ley que viene desde el pueblo, desde la ciudadanía, para cambiar lo que ellos deciden y lo que ellos quieren. También porque es una ley que cambiaría el paradigma de seguridad que rige actualmente, que está basado en la militarización. Entendemos la complejidad de la violencia en México, por lo cual reconocemos que no existe una sola solución mágica e inmediata para esta problemática. Sin embargo, hay pasos concretos que se tienen que dar para reducir la violencia y revertir los daños que ha generado esta política de guerra. El primer paso en este camino tiene que ser la regulación del mercado existente de drogas. Esto genera las condiciones para comenzar a reducir los daños ya causados. También es evidente que este esfuerzo no se puede dar de manera unilateral, sino que tiene que ser una política nacional con enfoques regionales que permitan la construcción de nuevas relaciones entre ciudadanos y sus gobiernos y entre México y Estados Unidos. Esas son estas palabras. Muchas gracias. something uh, that they want. 
Another argument that I use is this, when they ask me, why is addiction a disease? I say, well, think of diabetes. We don't tell people who are on insulin, you know, get tough, man, live without your insulin. We don't do that. We don't tell asthmatics to live without their inhalers. We don't tell people with high blood pressure to live without their blood pressure medicine. And so I try to say this is the same kind of a disease. And sure, we get people in addiction treatment programs and they fail. Sometimes they uh, don't succeed or they succeed for a period of time and then fail again. That's okay because people with asthma and diabetes and high blood pressure have ups and downs try to frame it like diseases that they're already familiar with. And that takes some of the tension out. I'm disappointed that there are not more elected officials here today. The district attorney, state's attorney for Baltimore City, Greg Bernstein, our former mayor, and me. I did email every member of the Maryland General Assembly who's in Baltimore City and the city council to, to come to this. And it shouldn't be hard. The headlines in the Baltimore Sun this morning Four people shot last night. Last weekend, 16 people, Labor Day weekend, shot in Baltimore City. And it's not just a city problem. My district is not in a city, it's out in Baltimore County. For those of you who know the geography, you know where that is. This is a problem that pervades all parts of the community, all races, all ethnic groups, all social strata, all income levels. And sometimes I also have to remind the folks out in my district that when their son or daughter has a drug problem and they think it's isolated and they tend to be more affluent so they're able to get treatment, you know, it's the same kind of problem that other people are having and they need to be, get connected with it. I thank you so much for doing the Caravan of Peace. I'm offering that we have to figure out practical politics. I think Kurt Schmoke hit the nail on the head. If you're, and I'll be blunt here, if you're a bleeding heart liberal who cares about you know, poor downtrodden addicts and people who have done time in prison, you should be for an addiction treatment program and turning this into a public health problem. If you're a hard-hearted conservative who believes in public safety and spending money efficiently and wisely, you should be for turning this into a public health problem. Obviously, there's a criminal justice aspect. There are diseases we can't treat. And frankly, there's some folks that are just plain tough and they're gonna have to have some prisons for them. But for the rest of this, there's so much progress we can make. We're not going to be able to cure it all, but at least we can decompress it. If we were able to t take the addicts that I take care of every day in the hospital and get them into treatment programs today, drugs, drug crime, violence, money, and health care issues would slow down tomorrow. Not next week, next year. Sometimes in health care we project activities and behaviors we hope 5, 10, 15 years from now will have some benefit. But this is one where the benefits are immediate. I can't think of a better, smarter way that ought to appeal to people across the political spectrum than to promote addiction treatment programs and look at this in a fresh way. Last thing I'll say on medical marijuana, I'm the lead sponsor of the medical marijuana bill in Maryland. We have a majority of the legislature for it, and I try to remind folks the polling. The polling in Maryland, and the scientific polls, not some random column, is 52% of Republicans favor medical marijuana, 70% of the Democrats, and 74% of independents. Why is that politically important? Because traditionally in politics, if you're a Democrat or Republican, you get those groups for you automatically. It's that middle group uh, that you're always fighting the battles to, to get the undecided vote, the middle of the road vote. So across the board, across the political spectrum, more than half uh, and up and higher of the Maryland public is strongly for medical marijuana, and yet our governor, and I'm a Democrat, our governor, Governor O'Malley, upended that legislation this last session. I try to remind them of that, I try to remind them and other leaders and my colleagues that this is politically smart, it's public policy, sound, and it's the right thing to do. Thank you for coming to Baltimore. I hope you see you together. Thank you, Dan. I don't know if we're going to call you Delegate Dan or Dr. Dan, but thank you. Absolutely. So, now we're going to go back in order. Um, Ms. Carlson, if you can stay there and slide the mic down, or come up. It's up to you. Whatever you're comfortable with. All right. Thank you very much. It's a privilege and an honor to be here with the rest of you and hear the very intelligent and wise words that have spoken before me. 
I'm the director of the Center for International Policies America's program. I'll be talking about the foreign policy aspects as well as what reform of drug policy means to end this war on both sides of the border. You know, it's been interesting for us on the caravan because in almost all the stops that we've gone to, what we've found is that it's really not hard to convince people that there's something terribly wrong with this war. To convince them that it is just not working and in fact that it's hurting people on both sides of the border in different ways in the United States, the cities that we visited, and within Mexico. Even the polls that are coming out show that the public now has come to the point where it's convinced that the war is failing and that even about half now are in favor of what used to be considered radical solutions like legalizing marijuana. And what we found also is that although most people are unaware of the situation in Mexico and really what the root causes are and how much this drug war policy has to do with the violence, they're still immediately struck with sympathy for the, the stories that they're hearing, for the universal sentiment of human loss, and also against drug by the fact that this model of trying to block supply by taking on the cartels within Mexico and trying to stop consumption by criminalizing drug use and drug users within the United States is again not working. So the immediate question is, is if, if there's this very broad public consensus, why hasn't anything been changed yet? And that's where we begin to see, you know, ask other questions. You know, why does the Mexican government continue to pay a huge proportion of a poor country's budget to fight this drug war that's not only failing, but that's generated so much violence? Why does the United States government continue to support this with over $2 billion in the form of the Merida Initiative and money from other sources? When we ask ourselves these questions, what we find is that it's really time to look behind the scenes of the drug war. And this is much of what former American Schmuck just talked about is there's some very powerful interests there. Some of those interests have, are in the form of economic interests and some of those are political interests. It's the power and the money that he spoke to us just a few minutes ago. Some of the fans, the promoters of the drug war, are very upfront and honest about it. There are politicians that have clear ties to the military establishment and to the business of war. Their job is literally, although they won't say this in so many words, to create conflict and then to secure the kinds of contracts they need to propose military solutions. They funnel government contracts to defense companies and then those same defense companies funnel money as a reward back into their political campaigns. This is part of what keeps the cycle of war moving and how the drug war is a part of that same thing. Unfortunately, these same politicians seem to have been the ones who wrote the Republican Party platform and foreign policy this year that just came out as part of the convention. They have invented a new term called narco-terrorism that attempts to equate counter-narcotics efforts with counter-terrorism efforts. And actually to say that someone who is a drug trafficker is also at least potentially a terrorist and that the, sale, the, the production and the transit of illicit substances, which happen so much in, in countries like Mexico and Colombia that was mentioned, is part of a sort of a terrorist national security agenda. This, of course, is false. In Mexico and Latin America, drugs are produced and trafficked. This is obviously true. But it's an illegal business that thrives off drug prohibition in the United States. You know, if a policymaker cannot tell the difference between drug trafficking, which is a business, and terrorism, which is a violent political agenda, they should not be in the business of making policy for the rest of us. Yeah. The other interests, of course, are economic, and um, the, this comes together with the politicians because the politicians who are manufacturing the pretext for war are complicit with the companies that are manufacturing the weapons for war. 
In this cycle, the drug war is really just the latest market for the intelligence and spy industries and for the weapons industries that are making so, many money, so much money off these contracts. Now, on this side of the border, it's really not the military so much as the security complex, so it's been called the national security complex. And that is to say private security companies, weapons industry as well, um, and, and, the, and the drug cartels that are also functioning here that are kind of running this. But then what's also been mentioned that's very, very important now is the way that private companies that run our prisons are now pressing for bigger and more prisons. And they rely on the drug war, the same way they rely on immigration laws, to fill those prisons and provide them with young clientele in order to keep their business going. We see that here, we've seen it since we've been in Baltimore, where they figure it's easier and more profitable to lock kids away than to educate them or to provide them with a decent job. We also travel through the Southwest, where, this, where we've seen the construction of these detention centers, detention centers behind whose walls women are being raped, prisoners are being killed for lack of medical attention, only for having to cross the border in search of a job. This has been part of a complex which one woman who was formerly incarcerated in New York said, it's that they're defining us as throwaway people. Nobody is a throwaway person. Now, what you'll hear from these victims that are here traveling with the caravan and the people we've heard with from, this, from in the cities in the United States is that really the biggest casualty of the drug war is public security itself. The drug war in both of our countries has put our populations at a great risk. So we have this war in which nothing makes sense. We've talked about examples so far, but I can give you just two really quick examples, again, from both here and there. There was recently an event in Mexico where it turns out that the Mexican federal police ambushed a U.S. Embassy car that was carrying CIA agents that were training members of the Mexican Armed Forces. Now, of course, the first question that everyone was asking is, why are the police? who are being funded by the United States to fight the drug war, ambushing and attempting to murder U.S. advisors who are also being funded by the United States to fight the drug war. We'll probably never know the precise answer to this question, but it has to do with the fact that the armed forces and the police in Mexico are so corrupt, you can't tell the difference between <laughs> the drug cartels and, and the security forces half the time. But there's another question here, too, and that is, why were U.S. CIA agents being funded to go down to Mexico and train 18-year-old Mexican recruits to shoot their own people? I mean, this is a drug war where the Mexican armed forces are in the street and they're attacking their own people. They like to say that 90% of them are people who are, are linked to the drug trade. They have no idea if that figure is correct. No one has any idea if that figure is correct. And in fact, the definition of innocent and guilty is not that clear when you have a war where the lines are so blurred. The second example is from here. Yesterday we heard about a 16-year-old boy who was shot by a 14-year-old boy with an assault rifle. And we learned that it's easier in many neighborhoods here in Baltimore to go out and buy an assault rifle in the streets than it is to buy a tomato. Because there's no fresh fruit and vegetables and the weapons are all there. So we have two examples of the kind of insanity we've been talking about all afternoon. And I want to be clear about something. We're not saying that drug abuse isn't a problem, or that organized crime in Mexico is not a problem. They absolutely are. And what we're saying, and everyone before me has said it, is that they're problems that have to be dealt with in a far different way. They're public health problems, they're crime public safety problems, they're not national security problems, and they're not problems that should be dealt with, with with repressive and militarized measures in either of our countries. And we know there's a better way. There's a better path to human security. There's a better path to human health and to community approaches to these problems. The needless grief, the danger we've been placed in by what are just plain bad policies by our governors, 
and that comes from for, by governments that for the most part really don't care about what's happening and seem to be deaf to our pleas and to the obvious evidence that this is not working out in Mexico and in the United States. Administration officials and those who benefit from the drug war, they say that the proposal to legalize marijuana is